Could an F1 car drive upside down? The whole world seems to think so, and in theory, they are correct. With some simple calculations, you can see that an F1 car can generate their own weight in downforce at 120 miles an hour, and much more when going at speeds close to 200. Now, this wouldn't be the first time a car's been driven upside down on a ceiling, but it's never been for more than a split second. But F1 cars with their ridiculous levels of downforce could, in theory, be driven upside down indefinitely or at least until they've run out of fuel. Well, today we are going to dive into the physics behind it, all to see if it's actually possible. And if it is, then why hasn't someone done it already? So let's set some rules. For this stunt to count, we say the car has to complete a full five seconds of driving upside down on a ceiling. No momentary flips or hot wheels loops. Just driving upside down with horsepower and downforce alone. Now, the whole reason that this question can even be asked is down to error. Dynamics, the complex task of using air to push a car harder into a racetrack so it can corner faster. In road cars, most of the grip is generated by the tyres being pushed down into the road surface by the weight of the car alone. For Formula One cars at speed, most of the grip actually comes from the air flowing over the wings and under the floor rather than the weight of the car itself, meaning that the faster they go, the more grip they have. That is the reason that race cars look like this, while the cars that you and I drive on the road look like this. So with that, let's get back to getting this F1 car upside down. Now for all this to work, we need the forces on the car to balance each other. Torque from the engine needs to overcome drag and the downforce holding the car up on the ceiling needs to at least match the gravity pulling it back down. But as we get up to the sort of speeds needed, the forces all change as well. Aerodynamic drag squares with speed and the downforce increases with it. Actually, the only thing that stays constant is the weight of the Formula One car at 752 kilograms, which is a lot heavier than they used to be. Now we already know that these cars can generate more downforce than than their weight, but it's more complex than that. Because when we flip our car upside down, traction becomes a problem too. Look at this. In normal running, an F1 car's weight and downforce act in the same direction, into the track. So the force on the tires equals weight plus downforce. But when we flip all of this upside down, things get a little bit tricky as the weight and downforce now act in opposite directions. So if they are just equal, there is no additional force pushing the tires into the road, or the ceiling in this case. And obviously we need that. Otherwise, it would be like driving on an ice lake and actually even worse. And that's why we actually need more downforce than the weight, just so we have the grip to maintain a constant speed. But how much downforce are we talking about? And consequently, how much speed? Let's look at the path of the car from its initial position on the floor. It's transition through the side of the wall onto the ceiling and back again onto the floor. The point at which the car requires the most amount of downforce is when it's actually upside down on the ceiling itself. So we're going to base all of our calculations on that requirement. Taking all of that into account, if we bolted on a Monaco spec downforce, essentially as much downforce as is legal in Formula One, the speed needed would be at least 130 miles an hour. This is just to create the car's weight in downforce or up force in this case, to hold the car on the ceiling. But as I mentioned before, the thing is, you need more downforce than this to have the grip needed to propel the car forwards. So in reality, the car needs double its weight in downforce in order to stay upside down and have enough grip to maintain speed. But what's awesome is that because downforce doesn't increase linearly with speed, we only need a little over 1.4 times the speed to get double the downforce. And that takes our number up to nearly 185 miles an hour, still easily achievable by any F1 car on the grid today. But remember that number for later as it's very important. So generating that much speed relies on all 1000 horsepower from the car, and that could be our next issue. Formula One engines are immensely complicated, but yet still very robust, and unsurprisingly, not made to run upside down. And that's largely because of the way these engines are fueled and lubricated, and the fact that those systems really won't like being flipped upside down. The engine oil lubricates the pistons from the underside, and the excess oil drips down, away from the combustion chamber because of gravity. Well, the problem is when we flip it on its head, 
the oil could actually leak into the combustion chamber and cause some real issues. And this is down to oil not compressing or burning like a mixture of fuel and air does. So after a few cycles at 12,000 RPM, you could get into a situation where the engine hydro locks. And just look at what happens when top fuel dragsters do this. The same goes for the fuel system. They are powered by a fuel pump, but you need gravity working in a certain direction just to get the fuel to the pump intake. So we could end up with a similar issue here. Now you could say that we only need five seconds of thrust and surely things wouldn't go too badly in that time. Although I'd want to be sure of that if I was actually driving the car. Well, disregarding the $10.5 million cost for each engine, you're adding an enormous risk. Any drop in power caused by potential issues with fueling and oil creeping into the combustion chamber would reduce speed, then the downforce and grip with it. And that crash wouldn't bear thinking about. So how do we run the engine when it's upside down? Well, the issue has already been solved by Acrobat aircraft which are capable of flying in a variety of orientations. They achieve this by using two separate sets of tanks, two for the fuel and two for the oil. One set of these is to fly the right way up and one for the other way up. But the issue with a system like this is that the aircraft's performance is severely limited when it isn't flying parallel to the ground, and so it can only invert in short bursts. Also, to avoid oil starvation, they actually have a system that cuts the load on the engine when the oil pressure is low. It works by reducing the angle of the propeller's bite into the wind, cutting the power for a brief second. But if a plane experiences a drop in thrust momentarily, the wings still produce lift holding the plane in the air. Our car, however, wouldn't. And once it lost connection with the ceiling, it would be game over. Okay, enough with the oily bits. What about motors that don't suffer with these inconvenient issues? What about Formula E? Looking at a Formula E car, it may seem like it would be the perfect choice. The tires are covered to reduce drag and these motors can run even in space because the batteries and the electric motor can run in any orientation and they aren't influenced by the direction of gravity. There is, however, another fundamental issue with them. The philosophy of a Formula E car is to minimize drag. This is done to maximize their range so they can complete their 55 mile long races on a single charge with some power management, of course. But with this emphasis on less drag, Drag, they also create less downforce and this is the issue. If we took a Formula E car to the 130 miles an hour speed, it would create less than a third of the downforce of a Formula One car. And also they weigh 903 kilograms. That's about 150 kilograms more than a Formula One car. And that means that they'd have to go a lot faster than the 185 miles an hour our F1 car would need to. And I really don't see a Formula E car doing that anytime soon. Now we could look outside regulated racing cars if we really wanted to make this happen. We know about an electric car that has monstered track records in a lot of places and generates over a ton of downforce and that's the VW IDR, which we included in our Pipes Peak video. But despite having a huge amount of downforce, it weighs more than one and a half times the amount an F1 car does at 1,100 kilograms, which would mean it would need to go much, much faster than its top speed of 170 miles an hour to have a shot at working upside down. And so it looks like we would have to figure out a way to get our internal combustion engine not to explode when we flip it upside down. Of course, one way would be to somehow use the electric power in our Formula One car to bring it up to 185 miles an hour, bring it onto the ceiling and then switch on our flipped internal combustion engine. Or of course you could do it the other way around. But it seems that the cursed system in a Formula One car is not powerful enough to do that. And so what we really need is an electric motor with the power of an F1 engine mounted in the high downforce chassis of an F1 car. Of course, the electric motor would need batteries to power it. But remember, we don't need the batteries to last the 55 miles of a Formula E race. We only need enough power to complete the length of the track. And so we could get away with using a much, much smaller and therefore lighter battery. But while we may have figured out the car, there is another important component of this stunt that we need to take a look at. Where on earth would you be able to pull this off? The obvious choice for this would be a straight tunnel where the car could run up to 185 miles an hour, ride up the side 
of the tunnel and onto the ceiling for a full five seconds and then come back down again before coming to a stop. Now, when you run the simple maths, the total length of track we would need from a standing start to a stop would be nearly two kilometers, accounting for the car's run up and the braking zone. So this means that the actual tunnel would need to be about a kilometer long, and that can't be too hard to find. Several tunnels with long straight stretches and smooth ceilings do actually exist, like parts of the Channel Tunnel and the Catesby Tunnel here in the UK. In fact, if we're looking for a spectacular setting to complement the nature of this stunt, there's also a tunnel for that. The longest tunnel in the world is in fact in Norway, and it's 15 miles long. It's called the Leierdal, 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 and it's called the Leierdal Tunnel. But despite that, this might actually be a very dangerous solution. You see, for this entire thing to work, we're relying heavily on a predictable and uniform flow of air over the car. And when the car transitions from the floor of the tunnel onto the wall, there is a point at which only three tires are actually touching the ground. This essentially increases the ride height and takes away much of the downforce generated by the floor of the car. And this can be as much as 60% of the car's total downforce. This could also turn the floor of the car into a kind of sail, further pushing the car to take flight. And we've actually seen this a number of times in IndyCar, Formula One, and and NASCAR, and it looks pretty terrifying. So because of that, we may only need our tunnel to be a kilometer long, but it also needs to be at least 20 meters tall throughout, with a seamless transition from the floor to the wall and then the ceiling for all of this to work. And unfortunately, there aren't too many of those in the world. So really, you would need to construct a tunnel yourself. And if you're thinking that sounds very expensive, you'd be absolutely right. I think this would only be feasible if you had a lot of cash and really wanted to make it happen. So the answer to my original question, could a Formula One car or even a current Formula E car actually drive upside down? Well, no, if you're keeping within the regs, but could a Formula One car with an electric motor do it? Well, yes, I think so, but it would cost an absolute fortune. You should check out this video we made on the genius aerodynamics behind F1 cars. We're gonna be making some more videos about driving a Formula One car upside down, so make sure you subscribe to catch those. Cheers, and I'll see you next time.